Some people think they're just a joke. But when you put your foot down, wow. In fact, you know, it's a, the world's best car. But it's a very serious sports car. They're quirky. They don't follow anybody else's pattern. They do their own thing their own way. I've heard it called an ugly duckling many times. It really is pure concord. Saab started making aircraft. They started in 1937, and the name Saab comes from Swedish aircraft. AB means limited. That's how it, the name comes from. And they were making aircraft up to end of the war here in Trollhättan. But during the last two years of the war, they were discussing what they were doing when the war ended, and everybody hoping there would be no more war. They, in fact, decided to go into making cars because they could not lay off the amount of people they had redundant. They decided to make cars, a pure economic decision. They had a huge specialist workforce that had been trained into making mechanical things, aircraft quality. So that was a philosophy, in fact, that dictated what their first car looked like. You can see by looking at the prototype that it's, it's, a, it's really a weird-looking thing. It was designed in a wind tunnel. It's very smooth. There isn't a straight panel on the car. They put a bed of manure on the workshop floor and put an oak block on top of that. And then they proceeded to, to shape the panels because apparently that this gave these master aircraft panel beaters the right degree of compliance in, 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 in beating these things into shape. Everybody said there was the strongest car made. And uh, I remember one of the managing directors hit a lamppost in the city here and that fell over the car and the only thing damaged was on the lamppost. So that was really strong. It's front-wheel drive. Now, for 1942, that was quite innovative. A two-stroke engine, uh, small, compact, took up very little space in the car. Reaction to this early prototype was very good, uh, even from the press and the public alike. And they decided then the investment was there to retool and make the first Saab car, the Saab 92. This is the Saab 92, very early model, and the first car was made 49, and I had one, the first one I bought was 1952, a second hand one, a green like this one, and everybody was green for the first three years. And the, the story is they had bought so much green paint for the aircraft and the military side, so this was left and we were painting them green for the first three years. And what I remember of the car, it was not the quickest one, I think, but it was extremely strong. Fantastic road holding like all Saab have had all through the history. And that's, I think, what people like. We sold fantastic well. We sold everything you can make. The early ones have some limitations. It got hot, very hot. For this 92 model, didn't have any cooling fan. So the only the speed when you were driving. People who went on holiday in Switzerland, they complained about this damn thing was boiling all the way up and the brake fluid was boiling all the way down. But nobody really listened to it for quite a few years. A two-stroke was simple. You know, they were light and very, very simple. There was only this one, only about six parts moving, and the three-cylinder later on had about nine parts moving. And uh, very, very simple. Could you get this spark plug right, it could run forever. As you can see, the car was made by aircraft people. It looks like a wing, and there were wind tunnel tested. There were not many cars at that time, what I know, who was wind tunnel tested. The results were extremely good. Uh, the model progressed logically from the 92 to the 93. It was a larger car, it fitted a larger engine, the interior appointments were much better, and generally it was a, an all-round better car. The Saab two-stroke unit was a very interesting engine in so much that it took them really through almost a decade 
when virtually everybody else was fitting four-stroke engines, Saab persisted with a two-stroke engine, simply because they refined it more than anybody else. It gave it an awful amount of power, given its specific size. It was capable of being highly tuned. It witnessed the success with Eric Carson in the rallying days. Saab were interesting in rallying, I believe, for the find out there was the best way to test the car. You can have the people testing a car on a test truck, but it's not the same as they come to competition. And that's why I think we were far ahead of other manufacturers. And the big wins come in the early 60s. Uh, I won RIC Rally 61, 62, 63 in Great Britain, and Monte Carlo 62, 63. When we won Monte Carlo Rally, it was fantastic for me, but I think at that time, the publicity from Monte Carlo Rally was something extremely good for Saab Company. People were looking at the fact they were winning rallies successfully, one after another, with a tiny little car, with a tiny little engine, and a rather large driver. It did the company no harm at all, and no doubt boosted their export sales, and certainly made the model more popular in the UK. Saab have not marketed themselves as much on their sporting pretensions, but they have used the two words unique and distinctive in their marketing. And I think in doing that, they were trying to suggest to people, the people who bought it, that you were buying something very different to the car down the road. It's a well-kept secret, really, that Saab made a sports car. It was introduced originally to the States because they, the major importers in the States, required a sports car. Saab drivers themselves are usually unusual people, and certainly the sonnet personifies that. I mean, they're extremely unusual shape, and I think quite exciting. Some people think they're just a joke, and I think it's how it takes you. I've heard it called an ugly duckling many times, but to me that is the great appeal of it. It is so different from anything else. I think it has a tremendous flair in its design. I think there's a, a real symmetry of form about it, and uh, I love it. I, I, I don't care what people say about that at all. Uh, for my money, the, the later Italian design isn't quite so perky, it isn't quite so nice, but it has its own charm as well. Uh, but they are certainly so different from anything else that that is an appeal in itself. The Sonnet 3 was produced up until 1974, and the, you can see the, the, the development that Saab did with the crash-proof bumpers. They, they would absorb five miles an hour impact. They had side impact protection in the, in the doors. They were meeting Californian emission requirements, which are very high at the time, and safety requirements. It was a very serious sports car and with the front wheel drive handling and perfect balance that the, the engine configuration gave it, it was the most fantastic car to drive. This car was very, very competitive. Uh, it was well able to handle MGBs, midgets, uh, Spitfires. It had no problem seeing those off. Saab made it a success because it was such a vivacious and sporty car. Uh, they were using front wheel drive simply because this was what they were used to manufacturing. It was the formula for their success in rallies and everything. And they were using 96 parts, Saab 96 parts. So they were using the same engine, the same transmission, uh, many parts. So the back suspension was all shared as well. Well, I first saw Saabs in about 1960 when I went over to Denmark on a school trip. and. The funny little car did rather appeal to me then. I'm actually a veterinary surgeon using just alternative medicine methods. This is homeopathy, acupuncture, herbs uh, for treating animals. And we find this very, very useful. But of course, it does make me a bit of a misfit. Um, I'm a little bit unusual in my veterinary work. And I suppose this goes along with owning Saabs, that uh, most people who own Saabs seem to be a little individualistic. Uh, they don't seem to be your normal car buyer. And it's certainly a minority uh, make of car.
So I'm ashamed to say I have 11 Saabs, in fact, in, in running order. We have two others, one for breaking, one for sale. But we have 11 actually running, ranging from the very, very first Saab that ever was imported into Britain. That's the, the LO 92 b uh, right up to a Saab turbo racer that actually won the Saab Mobile One Challenge in 1988. In the spring of 67, obviously Saab had some decisions to make. There, there was change in the air. They'd gone as far as they could go with these rather funny, uh, peculiar looking little cars. America, still their biggest market, dictated they had something more in the way of a comfortable passenger saloon. When you develop a car, you need something to, as a test bench for driving without any publicity. So we uh, very simply took an old Saab 96 cut it apart in two pieces and uh, widened it. This hybrid, as we call it, we uh, had a nickname called the Toad. And then we put in the uh, new engine and the uh, transmission, chassis and so on, for the new coming car. The new model, the 99, as it was designated, really was a complete departure from Saab, from their normal, small, rather quirky little cars. It really was a total sea change, and I think it really marks Saab's entry into the executive car market. Well, this is a 1978 Saab 99 Turbo. It was, if you like, the, the end development of the Saab 99 range. I think Saab were in a dilemma. They needed another engine uh, to compete with BMW and one or two other uh, larger manufacturers. And they wanted a new sporty image. So the, the obvious choice was to look for a different type of engine, which was probably a six-cylinder engine, but they couldn't get it under the bonnet. So their idea, bearing in mind they related to Saab Scania and the Scania lorry side, they looked into turbocharging. And this was the first application of a, uh, in a production car of putting a turbo on a, basically a standard two litre engine. They operated the head and strengthened it where necessary, but basically it's the, it's the standard cooking engine with a turbo attached. Performance can be dangerous, but it's not also dangerous not to have performance in, for example, overtaking. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the uh, turbo, we will say, give you more freedom to, to handle the car in a safe way. This was basically a prototype to introduce the press to turbo motoring, and they loved every second of it. The only time the turbo will cut in is when you floor the accelerator. Then you'll hear it start to spool up with a low pitch whine, and then all of a sudden the car takes off, and then you hang on. It's, it's interesting, random, but after, you get used to it after a while, especially when you've bought the second or third set of front tyres. Otherwise, it's just an ordinary standard saloon car, quiet and docile, no problems at all. It'll sit in traffic jams, it'll mess about, no temperament at all, but when you put your foot down, wow. Suddenly, you've got a sporty motor car, so you've got a family car and a sporty motor car in one. problems in the early days because people come tearing in off the motorway, stop with the, with the turbo glowing cherry red, which they do quite normally, quite naturally, and switch the engine off, and then the engine could jeel on the bearings. Next time it started the engine, it would whip the seals out the turbo, hence you'd see a, hear of people having turbo explosions, and that's what usually caused it. The modern ones now, they've got a smaller turbo, water-cooled, and they've gradually refined it till it's, it's really user-friendly now. You can forget all about them. I don't know why, why I started collecting Saabs, to be honest, because, well, I do, they're quirky, they don't follow anybody else's pattern, they do their own thing their own way. Basically, it's driver's enjoyment, and you, you get a hell of a lot out of your motor with Saab. The 99, in a rather circuitous route, uh, became the 900. Quite simply because Saab were not going to achieve what they wanted to achieve in the States with the current 99 model. There simply was not enough metal front and back to meet the very swinging uh, 
crumple and crash laws that were being introduced into America at the time. And they did this simply by extending the chassis to incorporate a longer overhang at the front and a longer overhang at the rear, which would comply with their regulations. The classic 900 was the car that did more facade than any other of its vehicles. It was a model that was introduced in 1979 and in fact continued to evolve till its run out year, which was 92 stroke 93. They still had this very strong aircraft heritage and it manifested itself in the design from this huge sweeping windscreen, really. But when you're actually sitting there as a driver, you don't get any A pillar in your line of peripheral vision. It really is pure Concorde, if you like. The original 1000 was launched in 85 and, and carried on Saab's philosophy with, with the turbocharged engine and offered uh, the public a, a high performance luxury car uh, with good fuel economy and good performance uh, and a good size package. The 9000 has consistently won safety awards every year since it's, uh, it was first produced, uh, both in the States and in Sweden. You know, independent uh, analysis of crash statistics have shown the 9000 to be one of the safest cars on the road. Saab have always been synonymous with safety. Their cars embodied all their aircraft practices in putting a vehicle together. You don't put one of these things in the sky until you're sure it's going to fly. They didn't put a Saab on the road until they were sure it was going to drive safely. Now we are a little different from the rest of the world, perhaps in, in Sweden and Scandinavia, that we have elks on our roads, big animals with long legs, heavy, if you hit them uh, by accident, then they will smash into your window and, and uh, they will totally destroy the, the compartment. So um, we have tests to verify that we can stand an elk test. So we have a specification for that. Tremendous feats of endurance actually achieved with the Saab 9000 Turbo was the, the Talladega Long Run, which was in the Alabama desert. They literally ran for three weeks at an average speed of around 130 miles an hour, and excluding driver changes and service stops, these cars ran non-stop for three weeks, which really did prove Saab's point, and that was a turbocharged car can be very, very reliable, and I think they proved that quite conclusively. Personally, I think, I think the 9000 is a great car. I've uh, driven the same one now for, for six years and so I see no reason to change it. It offers me exactly what I want. Uh, good road holding, comfort, good accommodation for my family of five, uh, a large boot space, good economy, uh, good everything. In fact, you know, it's a, the world's best car. We started racing the 9000 in 1989 because as a racing team we recognised you know, the, the potential of the chassis, the good road holding, the powerful engine and the good braking system. A lot of people within Saab and outside Saab said that the car couldn't win and when we persevered and uh, we won the, the, the Great Britain Championship for Production Saloon Cars in 1992. We had a jubileum for the aircraft division 1987. And with aircraft, it was very easy to show what the aircraft can do, all the air shows and things like that. And Scania trucks, they were showing big trucks and things like that. And our PR director at said, we must have something to show the car side and try to find out something. And that's why we started this. And we were doing two wheels, we were jumping and things like that. And I tell you, we broke quite a few cars before we got it right. We want to show how easy it is to drive a Saab for all the cars we're using are standard cars and the drivers in no way special either, they all work at the factory.
Saab as a company have never compromised on styling their vehicles, right from the very earliest vehicles, the two strokes, right to the very latest 900s and 9000s. They've done things their way. Now, as a purchaser of a car, you either love that or you hate it. I believe research has been done, uh, market research, to try and find out what makes a Saab driver tick. And I believe the Saab driver just does not fit into any particular marketing mould. They cannot classify the, that person. Presumably all sorts of different people come to Saab simply because they're individualistic. Saab has continued to have an image problem. It's very difficult for, for a lot of people to place you know, where the car is coming from, but that has worked to its advantage in, in recent times when, uh, during the recession, company owners felt they couldn't replace uh, Mercedes or BMWs and, and make the wrong sort of statement to employees who were being laid off, but they still felt they could, could spend the same money and have the same quality of car without making a, a huge image statement. You, know, you could buy a brand new Saab uh, and employees wouldn't be upset so much as if they bought a BMW. Saabs have generally cost more than the equivalent car. They've not necessarily made very bold statements, either in their advertising or in their street presence, but they have made a presence felt in the golf club, in the conversations in the pub, that you could say that your car was a bit different, a bit unusual, and wasn't going to be parked alongside something similar elsewhere. I think Saab's image problem comes simply from the fact they are a Swedish-built car. The Swedish culture is a very conservative culture. Uh, the Swedes don't want to shout about how good the car is, and perhaps that, that has led to this perception that they are a boring car. But uh, I think as time goes on, uh, and Saab will, will prove people to be wrong.